Several years ago, I read a book, and it was called The Church of Irresistible Influence. And uh, come to find out, it was written by a guy that pastors a church in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I read this book, and it was so cool because one of the pastors here in town, he said, Randy, somebody gave me this book. I read it, and I thought of you. I thought, okay. Somebody gave you the book. You read it, and you thought of me. He goes, you know, I'm not real outgoing and all, but you are. I really think you should read this. But the book basically surmises that uh, our, our job as the church is to build bridges into our communities. And uh, I think we have a, a picture that's coming up, and uh, the title today is Building Bridges. And so, as the story goes, he's using Mark 16 and 15, and which, which again, I've preached this so many times, but it's, it's become who I am, it's become who I want this church to be, and I would love to see every church be a church of irresistible influence. But it says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And then several years later, a great wise man added on, use words if necessary. <laughs> now see, here's the challenge. Everyone sitting in front of me today, listening by internet, watching on YouTube later this week or later this year, everyone that hears this message, you're preaching a gospel every day. No, so I said a gospel. The question the church has to answer is it the gospel? See, folks, by how we live and conduct our business in our everyday lives, people measure us, people judge us, people look at us. And if they know you go to church, they do that a little more harshly. <laughs> I'm not saying it's fair, I'm just telling you the way it is. And Lori, isn't it funny how non-church people know what we're supposed to be doing better than we do? Like, they know some stuff. <laughs> like, how do you know that? <laughs> They're smart. I mean, they've got enough of the Bible sense to know we're supposed to be kind. But there are church people that don't know that. Uh-oh. What happened to your face, Bill? <laughs> Didn't I just preach about that two weeks? I preached about it, getting you ready for it. But seriously, but, all right, there's, there's so many times we're going through life, we don't even think about how we react or respond sometimes. But when we do, we're letting people know where we stand with God. I don't think we mean to. I don't think we're thinking about it. I think we're just doing life, and sometimes our flesh gets involved, and we do silly stuff. We do mean stuff. We do hurtful stuff. We don't mean to. Because if we were really thinking about it, that's not who we want to be. I know I'm the only one in this building that's ever reacted with my flesh. All of you, you're spiritual. You get it right every time. You don't honk in traffic. You don't give one-fingered salutes. I mean, you just, you're spiritual. You never swear. <laughs> well, me and Brother Dickie, I'm going to throw him in there with me. <laughs> now, he ain't a swearing guy. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but he can be a frustrated fan. I'm just going to tell you right now. <laughs> but the point is, Amy, you taught me something when I worked with you at Tom Hall's. People are going to do some really hurtful things sometimes but you can't respond to that you just got to do what you know to do and how many days do I watch people in the workforce Jerry there's times in the body shop you get grilled man but how you respond is the gospel that's in your heart because here's what the Bible says from the abundance of your heart your mouth speaks so if it's in there it's going to come out What comes out? <laughs> I've said it before. When you get squeezed, what comes out? Eric, you ever get squeezed? <laughs> you like to do some choking back sometimes. Huh? I mean, that's, that's got to be the gospel. 
My pastor up in Youngstown, he start, started a slapping ministry. I was like, sign me up. <laughs> he goes, no, you're first. Pow! Okay, maybe not. Listen, folks, I'm not, this is the greatest challenge of being a Christian. It, it's, it's having discernment to say, what I say in this moment could be very detrimental to this person's life. And many times we're guilty, we react instead of respond. I'm guilty, but I want to get better. I want to be conscious of the fact that how I treat you can make a difference in your life. And even though you want to be a rear end to me, I don't have to be one to you. I can one-up you with kindness. We used to have a coach that told us all the time, boys, kill them with kindness. Knock them down, pick them up. That's kind of fun, actually. And you smile the whole time. I had a friend of mine that took this to an extreme. Have you ever heard of a kid playing basketball getting a technical foul called on them because they smiled at the ref? True story. Dole got three in one season. He just grinned, stupid grinned. Like, you messed up, ref, but I'm going to smile at you anyway. Technical foul. And our coach is like, how do you call a technical for smiling? The crowd would go nuts. Dickie would have been there. He would have been yelling. You'd have got kicked out. (laughs) Listen, but folks, isn't it better to respond with the love of God than Randy (laughs) or Teresa or Paul? And we forget so many times that's what people remember about our witness, our testimony, our gospel. And doggone it, they remember that one time we messed up, not the hundred times we got it right. (laughs) Hmm. So I'm not telling you this is going to be easy. I'm telling you it's rather hard, but we've got to do a better job as people preaching the gospel, not just our gospel. Because none of us are the exception to the rule. Not me, not you. Does your life point people to Jesus and the hope that we have in him? I've been with people that were going through real life devastating things. And I've seen their faith work when they got squeezed. And Chris, I can't tell you how many times I would pray as I would leave those situations and go, God, let my faith work if that ever happens to me. Because, you know, we can all say, if that happened to me, I would do this and this. Really? That's easy to say when it ain't happened to you yet. My prayer is, oh, God, let my faith hold up like theirs did. Because I've seen some really good examples of handling really tough situations by people that the love of Jesus came out when there could have been a lot of other things come out. I've told the story before, but my niece was involved in an accident where her boyfriend was in the truck with her and was killed in the accident. They called me. I'll never forget it. My sister called. She said, Randy, you need to call Brittany. She's a mess. She's in the hospital. She's been in an accident. Her boyfriend was killed. And she's okay. And as I'm on the phone with her, the dad of the boy came in the room. He said, Brittany, this It's not your fault. It's an accident. He goes, we're all hurting, but we're going to get through this, sweetheart. This is not your fault. I thought, how hard that must have been. But what grace, what godliness, what real love that his son's going, I got to worry about Brittany now. I got to make sure she's okay. And had the wherewithal to leave his son's bed and come to her bed and make sure she's okay. And I thought to myself, as I'm listening on the phone, because he didn't know we were talking, I thought, oh God, I hope my grace would work like that. Folks, people are watching. Preach the gospel. Use words if necessary. How we live and conduct our lives says a lot about what's inside of us. Matthew 5, 14. 
the scripture God really called me to preach with. Because I would say, God, do you want me to be a preacher, preacher, a youth pastor, a kids pastor, an evangelist, a prophet, a televangelist? No. Uh, What do you want me to be, God? And he'd say, be the light of the world. A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Matthew 5, 14. I said, okay, God, I'll be a light, but, but what kind of preacher do you want me? He said, am I, am I going to pastor a church? Am I going to work with a pastor? And what am I going to do? What am I going to do? He said, be the light of the world. And finally, after several years of praying this prayer, I realized until you're the light of the world, you don't really need to be preaching. <laughs> Folks, if you were the only light left in Lima, would there be any hope for people finding Jesus? Have you hidden it under the bushel? The old song's still true. Satan wants to get out. Boy, he works overtime, don't he? <laughs> There's times I want to hide my light and just be carnal. You know, I'm just wanting to let you have it. <laughs> and I remember I can't snuff it out. I can't hide it. It's just going to shine. So let's do it right. If people follow our light, will it lead them to Jesus? Can they even see our light? According to this book, he talks about we're bridge builders, building bridges into the lives of others to tell them about the love of Jesus and the difference he's made in our lives. It tells of the story that, you know, everybody talks about the the great Niagara Falls. and, And back in the day, they were trying to build a bridge. And the great bridge builder said he would give $100 to anybody who could fly a kite across that great chasm. And some kid got his kite to the other side. And they tied a rope, a little bigger rope to it. And they pulled it back across. To put a little bigger rope to tie, to run it back across. Till they got a cable and then a bigger cable. And then they built the first suspension bridge across Niagara Falls. It's a pretty cool story. But it started with a kid and a kite. Now, who would ever thought flying a kite would be noble, Matt? Pretty cool. He started what we now get to drive over. If you ever go and drive that bridge and see Niagara Falls, he started that. It's the little things we do for others sometimes that ultimately makes the biggest difference later on when they really need us. It's the kindness you show today that two years from now when they're in a great tragedy, they remember your kindness and they say, hey, I need you. What are we doing to build bridges into our community individually and collectively as a church? Yeah, we're building beds and we call that the bridge builders ministry and it is. And uh, as of this weekend, Dave was texting me, we need eight more built like yesterday. So he's going to be scheduling that. We're going to need some help putting them together and getting them delivered. 90 already out, close to 100 when we get done with this next batch. It's amazing. But what else are we doing? Are we engaging our community with the love of Jesus? What are we doing just to show kindness? He tells the story in the book that as the church grew and it got to be like 3,500 people and man, they just, it was a mega church and just stuff going on all day, every day and a full-time daycare. And a, I think they even had a grade school, maybe, I don't know, but it was stuff just going on all the time. And, and the pastor said all the time things were going really well. He said he kept feeling something was missing. He couldn't understand it, but something was eating at him, and he, he was getting frustrated. He said, you know, I should be sitting back going, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. He said, but I feel like something's missing. So one day as he was driving out of the neighborhood, he said there was an older farmhouse sitting at the end of the driveway, first house on the left. He said, now, granted, there was a whole new neighborhood built all around her. With new homes that had happened because they had moved their church out there. And there was another new neighborhood over here and another new neighborhood over here. But she was the old house that was there when they started. She was out in the yard. And he pulled up in the driveway and he got out and he said, hey, ma'am, got a question for you. He goes, what do you know about that church over there? Now, folks, she's an expert on that church. She was there before they got there. She'd watched it grow. She said, well, 
It sure is a busy, booming place, but they ain't never done nothing for me. And he thought, we're reaching around the world. And we hadn't even touched the neighbor at the end of the driveway. First house on the left. My heart breaks. I wonder how many houses right here go in any direction. How many lonely people are within an arm's length of our church right now that need Jesus? And we can go touch a lot of people, but are we even ministering to people next door? Now, Dave did one day. They were here cleaning the church one year. And I think you remember this, Dickie. And my mower was here because they were going to mow the grass. I was out of town. And, and uh, I always seem to be out of town on work day. I'm a pretty smart pastor. <laughs> but they had my mower here. And, and, and the guy next door had walked over and he said, hey, uh, do you ever use that mower to help people? He said, my mower's broken. I, I, I pay you to mow my grass. And Dave came and asked Bryden if he thought it would be all right if he used my mower to mow somebody's grass. I'm like, are you kidding me? But, but anyway, so, so Dave goes there. He goes, but... For the pay, I want you to come to church Sunday. And he did. I said, you know what? I'd mow everybody's in that whole neighborhood's grass fed all come on Sunday. And I thought, or would I? <laughs> well, gas was a buck ninety a gallon, I might have, but 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 listen, seriously, it's the little things like that. And that Dave had the word I'll say, hey, I'll trade you. Jerry, you made a deal with the kids and owed you a favor. He bribed him to come to church. I said, is that legal? He said, you owe, you owe me, but all you got to do is come to church. And he's been here three times. All three times he owed Jerry. <laughs> I hope he owes you again this week. No, I don't. I don't wish that on him. But, but the truth is, folks, what can we do to do that, to touch the first house next to our house? Does our neighbor know the love of Jesus? Do we know our neighbor? It's summer. Think of someone you have a desire to join you in church. It's summer. Longer days, more free time, warmer weather. And all you cold people really like warmer weather. What would it be like if this summer you made an intentional investment in that person or people by doing some random acts of kindness? Some fellowship in your home, a cookout. And you know, the, the person God wants us to reach the most sometimes is the one we want to spend the least amount of time with. That's why he put them in your life. <laughs> you consider them a thorn in the flesh, and God says, tell them about me. I'm like, I don't want to tell them about you. <laughs> they might go to church with me, and i got to put up with them more. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Listen. I don't want anybody in town to be able to say, our neighbors especially, yeah, it seemed like a good church, but they never did nothing for me. What can we do? What can we do to impact fast schools next year? Let's don't wait till school starts. Let's don't wait till the next tragedy. Let's plan ahead. Let's invest love in them and plan to feed the football team. Plan to feed the teachers and show appreciation during appreciation week. Folks, we ought to be the most creative group of people on figuring out who we're going to bless next. Have we ever fed the fire department? Have you ever thought about 24-hour shifts in a yucky fire? Well, it's not yucky. It's pretty nice, but still. And having a home-cooked meal from Miss Regali. That's your maiden name, right? She can cook. show up and say, fellas, the Bridge Church and my family just wants to love on you and tell you we appreciate you being here for us. Folks, this is doable. 
But we got to think about what we want to do. What act of kindness can we do for the neighbor, the neighborhood? I've told this story, but I remember when I came to Lima, there was a group of men, and they would pray every week at, at the uh, radio station, WTGN, and I'd go every week, and, and they would talk about the needs in Lima, and I said, we're going to pray about it, we're going to pray about it, we're going to pray about it. And we prayed, and we prayed, and about a year, and I said, guys, i got to be honest with you, I'm sick of praying about it. And you'd have thought I wrote Ichabod over my forehead. I said, when are we going to do something about it? Because the, the word go is an action word. It's do. Go do something. Yes, we got to pray. But there's some things you don't have to pray about. You see a need, you meet the need. You need 10 bucks, I got 20. God bless you. Now, you need a million? I'm praying for you, brother. <laughs> right? I need help. Mending my roof. I got connections. I know some people. I need help rebuilding my house. Okay, we've got to pray about this one. How do we help them? But how do we meet needs as a church family? What, what always drives me crazy, it seems like the people we help, it never really helps. We never can find the right people to help. I, I can tell you story after story, just since the bridge is open, especially one young man that we've helped quite a bit financially. He's not even here anymore. He's not serving God anymore. He's just AWOL. And all the help we did, he's still losing what we were helping him keep. And I just think, and I said, God, help us to make wiser investments. Help us to do a better job discerning. Yet we want to help people. But what's really helping Maybe some of you have more wisdom on that than I. You need to let me know. I'll be glad to turn that portion of our church over to you. Because I feel like a failure sometimes. Did I really help him? And it kills me. But what can we do? Not just prayer, but prayer and planning. And put some action into our prayers. Use what we have in our hand, the resources of the people in our church. We have people that can cook. We have people that can clean. We have people that can build. We got people that can fix cars. We got people that can just be kind. We got people that can pass out coffee. Easter service. Y'all remember how cold it was on Easter? Anybody forgot that yet? This week is your week. But the funniest thing I saw was a gentleman, and he was a visitor. He walked up the table, and Morgan and uh, I think Tanner were there helping serve. And he goes, whose dumb idea was iced coffee on a cold day like today? <laughs> and Morgan goes, I have hot coffee over here for you. She just bat an eye, man. She's like, he goes, I'll take a cup of that then. Because he's all the big two carafes of cold coffee. He's like, whose dumb idea was that? I thought the same thing, but I saw a lot of y'all drinking it and then crying because you was cold. Come on, man. My life scripture, the greatest commandment in all the law, love the Lord, love each other. Too many churches do such a great job loving the Lord and such a poor job of loving each other. Folks, you can't have one without the other. You can't truly love the Lord without loving others. I'm sorry. They're connected. All ten commandments we shared, four of them about your love for God, six of them your love for each other. Jesus just summed it all down in two things. Why do we struggle loving people that are different from us? Sometimes we love each other in the church, but we don't love each other in our neighborhood. How are you doing at loving God and others? If ever there was a day our community needs what we have, it's now. People are scared. The economy's a mess. I don't have to tell you that. And if you think about it too much and get really stressed, 
But when you're a believer, you know that God's working on our behalf and God's going to supply our needs according to his riches and glory because we're handling our finances God's way. We're doing things God tells us to do, right? At least I hope you are because the only guarantee you have is God's plan. So you better be doing it God's way or it's going to cost you. But the truth is when we trust God and we handle our money God's way, we do what we're supposed to do. He's going to take care of us. I know right now for some it's more bills at the end of the month than income. It gets stressful. And sometimes the first thing you want to do is say, well, I, don't, I can't afford to bless the church this month. This ain't a money message, by the way. It's just I'm giving you reality. When you keep first things first, God will take care of you. When you do it any other way, you're on your own. I'm just telling you. I'm glad somebody taught me that a long time ago. Because I can't tell you how many times I've been to the end and God provided. And he always does if we handle it God's way. I encourage you with that today. got to hurry. If the hope of Lima was dependent upon the bridge, would there be any hope for Lima? Say it this way. If the hope of your neighborhood depended on the hope in your home, would there be any hope for your neighborhood? If the hope in your home was based on the hope you have in yourself, is there any hope for your house? That's good preaching. I know y'all are just shouting in glory, hallelujah, but. It's really hard, Xavier, to give something away I don't possess. I don't have the knowledge to help you get any better at what you're doing in sports. So I'll leave you alone. <laughs> But there's some other things I have that I can help you with about life and choices and, and decision making. So I'm going to give you from what I have some encouragement on your journey of what God's using you to do. But I can't give you something, Xavier, I don't possess. And I see a lot of church people that want to do something for God. They don't know where to start. They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to get this love that God put in them out to others. Pray about it. Say, God, show me ways I can take from what I have to bless others. One guy in our church told me not too long ago, he said, you know, because he, he, he's a pretty good mechanic. He said, there was a day when, when your number came up on my phone, I cringed at who am I going to help today? <laughs> he goes, and I recognized the other day you hadn't called me and asked me for anything in a long time. And I said to him, be careful what you ask for. And I've had him busy the last couple of weeks. Listen, from what we have. See, that's the thing. We think being used of God is going to be so stressful because we're going to have to come up with some new ideas. Folks, some of it, it's just doing what you already do. Just extend your, your territory. Add new people. Yeah, you don't have to kick your old friends out. Just add some new friends. And one of the best gatherings you can have is when you have a few church people. And a few not so church people, and you mix them up, and you'll find out they got a lot more in common than we think. But they're really not that much difference. Everyone's a prayer away from greatness, or a decision away from failure. All of us. I love people looking down their nose. That'll never happen to me. <laughs> okay. Where's the hope? For the mom-to-be who goes to her obstetrician for a routine checkup and hears the words, I'm sorry, I can't find a heartbeat. You know where their hope comes from? The other ladies that have been in that boat. And they find out about it and they go, to them, say, sweetheart, I've been there. Let me walk with you. Well, the memory's too painful then use the pain part to help the next person in pain. Or the single mom who works a full-time job by day, sometimes another part-time job at night, and serves as both mother and father, and wonders, how long can I keep this up? I think the church has an obligation to 
help some of those single mamas. Not as a church, but as people. I used to, I have, I've had a dream for years of creating a, a, a uh, duplex neighborhood. One side, senior citizen. The other side, single mom or dad. Because I'm going to tell you, there's single dads out there too. A lot of them. We got some in our church right now. And my thought was, the single mom or dad, they may have some energy, but they need some wisdom. Who's got the wisdom? Hello. Life experience is sitting next door. Sometimes, a single parent can go run errands and get groceries for everybody, and they help watch the kids. And they ain't an older person in the world don't like watching little kids. That's fun. Especially somebody else's. Give them candy. Hope mom comes home quick. But so, I've had that dream. Because to me, it's older teaching younger and younger, giving energy to older, giving purpose to both. Amen. Call me crazy. The person who battles depression and anxiety. Folks, the church don't have answers for this, I'm telling you. And it's killing me. To the point I'm making plans to make sure we have some pl things in place to help people that are battling depression and anxiety. The church needs to be involved in the process. Where's the hope for the person who stands by their spouse's bedside as they lay dying? Where's the hope for a generation of young people who seem to be such an easy mark for drugs, STDs, abuse, gangs, or the pain of a broken family? The question is, where is hope? What is its source? What reason is there to hope? Do you have hope today? Do you have the love of Jesus in your heart today? You cannot give something away you have not yet received and on the flip side of that I believe this with all my heart if you have received it you can't help but want to give it away see I think in the church world there's, there's ministry in the church for church things and church people and church activity we have kids church to teach and to raise up kids we have youth ministry we're going to so we can help our young people and the challenges they face but there's also community ministry folks I don't think I think the church that just worries about this group ain't gonna make it very long what about that group what about the neighbors in the drive first house on the left what are we gonna do what are you gonna do you have a neighbor in need? Are you helping them? Are you meeting the need? Are we so busy we don't even see the need? Where do we start? What can we do to love God and love others? And what could we do if we collectively pulled our resources and did something significant for Lima? Father, thank you for your word, your challenge. But God, more than being challenged, we've got to come up with some plans, some ideas. With your help, God, you're going to lead, guide, and direct the Bridge Church to make a difference in our neighborhood, in our community. God, I don't know the, all the answers, but you do, and you have a plan and a purpose. So God, as we close this service and we open some dialogue, I pray that you will open our hearts to hear from you. God, there's some of the most creative, great minds sitting in front of me today. And I just pray you'll use them to help us to be what you call us to be. In Jesus' name.